I love how thumbs up is still the way we do these things. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. Um, thanks for coming to this week's optimization seminar. Uh, our speaker this week is David Ray from the uh, Our City Project, uh, which is a big multi-site project that's based here at the University of New South Wales. Um, he's going to talk about, I think, where did you guys get this paper? Um, it's something in uh, Transportation Research Board. Okay. In the Transportation Conference at uh, TRB in Washington. Oh, nice. And um, it's been published a few months ago. So in the, in the journal of the conference. Okay, sounds good. So without further ado, here's David. Okay, hello everybody. So I'm going to talk about uh, transit route uh, design, which is the um, problem of solving, um, how finding a good design um, in the transportation network. The problem can be pretty, uh, can take multiple aspects. There are, there are aspects where you just look at how you design a network and it can go uh, as in detail as uh, designing how a bus route would be laid out in a transportation, uh, well, in a, um, in a transit network. And we are presenting some work that we um, have done by uh, solving the problem through uh, wireless data collection algorithms. Well, so basically, we use the solution method from the wireless sensor network uh, domain and applied it in a transportation setting. So the motivation um, of this talk is that um, basically we were looking at a problem uh, which is very common in uh, cities when we want to add a new uh, bus route. We want to see uh, where should it stop. And ideally, we want to look at what's the frequency of the vehicles, what's the maximum uh, route length, like because if it's too long, then it's going to take long uh, for a vehicle to go through. Um, what's the headway, what's the load of the transit vehicles, so how many people they should carry and how, many, how well will that uh, service the, um, the demand, the network, so the, the people who need to travel. And you can also look at the maximum number of vehicles that you should use. Mm, in general, the problem is designed as a um, multi-objective, non-linear optimization problem. And you're trying to optimize uh, system performance. So that could be everything from uh, total delay um, indicators, which, uh, which represent operation cost uh, of passenger time or access to transit. It depends a lot on what exactly you're solving, but basically you, you, there are several studies on um, the way you can model such problems. And generally, they end up pretty complicated. And there are most like most of results through meta heuristics and with very little work done in exact algorithms because of the large uh, size of the instance, which are generally at stake. In our, in our presentation, in our study, we're going to focus on a single objective problem, a very uh, simplified variant uh, with regards to what has been done in the literature, where uh, since people use meta heuristics, they, use, they look at many uh, formulations which address uh, multiple objectives. And um, basically, um, we'll define a problem, which we'll call the transit route design problem. And we'll say that uh, uh, the objective of this problem is to find a set of uh, a route which minimizes the distance from a set of nodes, which we'll call demand centroids, to a route subject to a, a tour duration constraint. So it's basically uh, saying that you want to visit a maximum number of uh, points, nodes, in a city. and your objective is to minimize the distance to that route subject to some resource constraint, uh, which here we choose to uh, represent as the tour duration. It could have been route length in distance, but we, we use the travel time. The potential application of this uh, single objective problem and uh, single route also, because we're only looking at designing a single route, is to, for instance, uh, distribute vaccine in, um, um, in situations where you need to, uh, to address uh, 
um, a large uh, population, but you, you only have limited resources to distribute uh, your product. So you want to, to have a tour which visits as much people as possible. But on the other hand, you cannot go and visit everybody. Evacuation routing is also of interest because you generally uh, uh, need to um, span a large uh, area fast enough and you need also to deserve it quite well, otherwise it's uh, pretty um, um, not efficient. And finally, the last application of that and the most important for today um, has been the data collection problem in wireless sensor networks. So that is actually where the idea of this paper came from, because um, some of my co-authors, uh, Levi Liebman, Anastasios Viglas, and uh, Haled Armeni, who have been working on the, the problem of collecting data in wireless sensor networks. And they have uh, ending up uh, using a lot of uh, routing algorithms, which uh, we are familiar with in transportation, but that uh, were not formulated and presented the same way that we used to do. So we have basically tried to adapt their solution methods to our to the transit route design problem. And um, I'll just quickly give um, some information about wireless and some networks. It's not my field of expertise, but I have come to know a little of it. So basically in wireless sensor networks you 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 use sensors which communicate uh, wirelessly and they they are generally used to collect data and then you had you have to forward the data at the sink the um, one of the the most established fact um, with regard to data collection in wireless sensor network is that um, wireless communication will result in major energy consumptions and that at some point that will limit the lifetime of the wireless network. So this has led um, people to uh, look at um, several approaches to collect this data. In particular, uh, we can, uh, in wireless sensor network, people look at uh, multi-hop configurations where we try to limit the number of hops that uh, hops is like the distance between two sensors that has to be um, traveled by uh, data, so such as to limit the, the number of uh, wireless communication. The problem is that in multi-hop, um, the sensors which are closer to the sink will forward all the traffic of the rest of the sensors and they will, uh, they will lose their energy more faster, faster than any uh, of the other network sensors. And that will of course um, make access to this uh, to the sink impossible because nobody will be able to forward any more traffic to the sink. So a turn uh, a turnover um, a turnaround to this situation is to use mobile elements to roam in the network and visit a subset of the sensors so as to collect data using uh, short range communication which, uh, for reasons I could not explain, um, uh, consume far less energy than wireless communication. So I know this is true, but I cannot explain it in a proper uh, um, scientific um, regardless uh, to you because it's really not my field. But basically, mobile elements can help in saving uh, energy in the network. Uh, so. Uh, in the end, uh, uh, increase his, its lifetime. But um, it has also been observed that if you try to visit every sensor in the network, you're not really efficient because then it takes either too long, and so your data freshness is not uh, maintained. You need to collect the data quite often, otherwise it becomes really obsolete. And also you, you need to look at memory consumption, so that's one also of the reason why you need to collect uh, frequently data but you, you also want to um, make sure that the sensors are able to, uh, uh, to be uh, accessed. And if, if it, the, the, the domain is too large, it will take forever to, to collect and come back to the sink. So the, the methodology used is to use uh, caching points, so a subset of the sensors, which will collect the data and keep, those, uh, keep this data um, like they would act like a sink, they would be able 
after to forward this uh, data to the, the, the unique sync by wireless uh, communication, but the, that would mean far less uh, communication on average. So that's the methodology and some well-known facts in uh, wireless sensor networks. And in the end, the, the problem solved here is very similar to the problem we are looking at. Um, in the transit route design, we want to find a route which minimizes the distance from centroids, which are, you can, if you're not familiar with the term, a centroid can be roughly a, a street intersection, a neighborhood, or even like a, a postal code, depending on the scale of your uh, model. And you want to find a route that minimizes the distance from centroid to, that, uh, to the route, and you want that route to be no longer than uh, a certain value, which could be used to represent, in the context of transit uh, route, the frequency of vehicles, because basically it gives you how much time is needed to complete the tour, and that is roughly uh, how often a bus would uh, travel in the network. From the wireless uh, sensor network side of, the, of things, uh, you want to find a route which minimizes the distance uh, from sensors to caching points, and the tour duration constraints uh, act as a, uh, a period uh, constraint. You want to visit the sensors often. So the, the, the both problems are very structurally similar. Of course, we have adapted also the transit route design to fit that problem in the sense that we are looking at the single route. We could look at the multi-route, but that's a really um, upcoming extension of the model. And in this, in this uh, talk, I'll just focus on um, finding a tour, so very similar to the TSP in this sense, but also assigning demand centroid to transit station, such as to uh, minimize the total distance to the route. So I'll quickly um, go through the model. Um, the notation used is quite conventional. We have a set of demand centroids, a set of arcs, um, not uh, necessarily a very connected network. It's a transportation network, so average node degree is about four, maybe three, but uh, far from uh, we're far from a complete network here. The distance between two centroids can be measured uh, using shortest path uh, algorithm. Uh, so that can be obtained uh, a priori to the optimization. The travel time is expressed uh, in time units. Dwell time will represent the time a transit vehicle will stop at a node. So for every transit station that we uh, open, we want to represent the fact that a vehicle will have to stop for some time. We call this dwell time, and um, it's, uh, it could be station dependent. The transit range will represent the maximum acceptable walking distance. So therefore, the, 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 the maximum distance that uh, we would allow uh, a user uh, to be assigned to a transit station. So we, uh, it, it's, of course, something very common in transportation to, to look at this um, value, because if you have a very high transit range, then most likely service is not used. We could have an elastic demand formulation to represent the fact that the further away the transit route to the century, the less people travel. But for this problem, we have focused on simply assigning centroids to stations, and we are not looking at how many people exactly want to travel. So we are not looking at the load also of the transit service. And finally, the tour duration, which will be uh, the maximum tour duration here, which will be the resource constraint of the model. From this notation, we can extract two uh, graphs. The assignment graph, which will be composed by all links uh, which have a distance, basically all pairs, yeah, all links which have a distance which is lower than the transit range. So in this graph, uh, we are looking at how people can walk. You cannot walk further than TR, and basically, this graph is a subgraph of the graph formed by V and A, where only a subset of the links are uh, maintained. The routing graph, on the other hand, will use all the arcs available, but will look uh, the weights on the arcs will be uh, the travel time plus the dwell time at the destination node. So it's a simple um, um, 
slight offset for for the uh, wait waiting time with regards to the uh, initial travel time. And basically, the routing graph is the graph in which we have to plan the tour, the vehicle tour. Now, given those two graphs, the problem, the transit route design problem that we want to solve, can be summarized as finding the optimal tour in the routing graph such that the m total distance from the, uh, the demand centroid to the tour in the assignment graph is minimized and its duration is at most the maximum tour duration. So that's just to give some insight. Um, so we can represent this uh, model using um, integer programming. And in order to give uh, some, uh, in, some um, info insight on the model behavior, we, we decided to first express the model as a, as a mixed integer program and then solve it with a uh, commercial optimization uh, software on small instances before looking at uh, larger uh, case studies. So I'll describe briefly the decision variables and the objective function. The routing variables are very straightforward. We, they're similar to any TSP. We use xij as a binary variable to represent the fact that archij is in the tool. The assignment variable uh, are also quite conventional. We use uh, yij to represent the fact that the demand centroid is assigned to a transit station. And um, the, using this notation, the objective function of our model can be uh, expressed as the minimization of two terms, the assignment cost, which um, estimates the amount of uh, walking distance which is resulting from the, the, the assignments decisions, and the routing um, cost, which represents the distance traveled by the um, vehicle. So basically, it's expressed in distance, this cost, but the second term is just here to uh, make sure that we don't pay the price of uh, what the vehicle travels. So basically, people who, it, it's the second part of the objective is actually more like a, uh, an, an offset to adjust the value of the objective to, to represent correctly the total distance from transit because we will uh, enforce in our constraint that every station is assigned to the next station. And of course, we don't want to pay that price in the objective because it's, uh, it's done by the vehicle. So it may not be very intuitive, but basically the second part is very much just to adjust the value. The assignment constraints are probably the most important constraints here. And they uh, roughly uh, express the fact that every demand centroid should be assigned to at least a transit station. So there are quadratic constraints. Um, they're represented as an inequality, but we could have uh, an equality for the first one. We could assume that you only assign to a single uh, station. But of course, since the objective is to minimize the assignment cost, uh, the, the upper constraint is always binding. And the transit station can be assigned to the next station, as I just told you. So basically, that's why we need to take out this cost in the objective. The tour duration constraint is also a very important constraint. It will simply say that total duration of the tour is no longer than TD. And that uses the travel time metric, which compose travel time and dwell time. Now, the flow constraints are very uh, conventional flow constraints. We want to propagate a unit of flow from a sink, and we, uh, we ensure flow conservation. Of course, we also have to make sure that there is no subtorque since we are solving a TSP-like problem. So we use a regular um, DFG constraint here. And the obtained model uh, can be summarized as, um, so this is actually a mixed integer quadratic program. Um, although the, the objective, objective function is linear, uh, there we have a quadratic constraint, number two, and an exponential number of constraints because of the subtour elimination um, procedure. So uh, what we have done when we, when we have uh, obtained this model, we, we decided to look at it, as I told you, uh, using 
regular um, optimization software. So we first reformulated that model to be completely linear using some very generic reformulations. And we found, uh, we used a, um, a very well-known transportation network, which is known as the nguyen dupuy network, which consists of 30 nodes, 19 uh, links. And basically, it's a traffic network where people have worked, that have, people have used a lot to look at traffic assignment problem and network design. So we use it to solve a, a very simplified uh, example, an illustrative example. In this example, we used um, no restriction on the assignment. So we did not differentiate the, we did not reduce the number of links in the assignment graph because otherwise the, the graph is so small that you end up very much uh, reducing your solution space a lot. And so it's just an assumption, but basically every node can be assigned to every other node. The, transit, the travel time is used to represent the distance between centroid. So we don't use distance, we only use travel time in this problem. And we, um, we use a dwell time of one minute. The figure on the left hand, uh, right hand side shows what we have obtained by solving that with um, the Ampel CPLEX uh, frameworks for multiple values of the tour duration constraints. So basically the green curve represents the objective cost and is plotted uh, in function of the tour duration constraints which span from uh, 14 to 100. Below 14 we could not have solution any solution because of the dwell time, there was no cycle in the network which would uh, have a lower cost than uh, 14 minutes. And uh, after 100 uh, minutes, there is no uh, more improvement in the objective function. So basically we have found the, the longest cycle in the network and we're visiting everybody. And this cycle has exactly 12 uh, stations. So the, um, I should have said that the objective function, its cost is plotted on the left uh, hand side axis, and whereas the red curve, which depicts the number of stations uh, introduced by the model, uh, uses the right hand side axis. So of course, the, the, the big trend here is that uh, the objective function increase, uh, decreases with the tour duration, number of station increases with the tour duration, although sometimes, as you may see, uh, around uh, 80 minutes the 80 minute uh, tour duration constraint, we have decisions which go back and forth between um, adding a station. So it's not always that uh, allowing more, giving more resource will always have more station. There could be some trade off depending on what happens on the topology of the network, but roughly it increases. And uh, of course, uh, the maximum. Is uh, a question here? Yep. So, uh, I, I was just wondering uh, what was the uh, linearization technique you used? So I used uh, some, um, it's called I think a fortet linearization where you introduce auxiliary variables to uh, linearize the product of binary variables. If I okay. come back quickly to the model, so the, the nonlinear constraints is constraint number three which is represented by a sum of binary variables. And you can simply add three constraints and a new auxiliary variable uh, pair, um, pair of binary bi variables. And you, you say that every binary variable should be uh, lower, that the, the auxiliary variable should be lower than one and greater than the sum of the, vari the binary variable minus one. And yeah. that enforces Yep. Yeah, I, 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 um, I, I know the book that... Uh, oh, okay, okay, sorry. Uh, I didn't know it. Did you take advantage of uh, the fact that uh, uh, you have like redundant binary, like, so Y multiplies many X's? Yeah. Did you take advantage of that? The, 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 sorry, I, I'm not sure I understood the advantage of the fact that Y multiplies many X's. Yeah, yeah, so you can make, so you could have a tighter uh, linear relaxation. You take, because oh. you're taking every pair, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I see what you mean. I, I think we tested some of that. Um, 
we have actually not spent much effort in uh, uh, tightening very strongly the, the, the program because uh, we used it then on a very large network and uh, this actually uh, termed the sub -tour elimination constraints very, very much uh, problematic. So I remember I've done some testing on that. Uh, I'm not sure I used the exact uh, tight, tighter form reformulation you're suggesting. Um, but yes, it's certainly of interest to, to, to reduce the number of uh, uh, variables. So um, the last uh, thing that we observed in the, when solving this model is that the tour duration constraint was almost binding, uh, always, which uh, which means that uh, roughly the, the the model correctly exploits every resource available. Of course, depending on the the, the scenario, uh, it may not always be binding, and that was really much really just to make sure that the model had the correct behavior at optimum. Um, like I said, the, the, the objective of this work, the, the, the really uh, main motivation was to use uh, the algorithms for wire, from wireless sensor networks to solve uh, large uh, scale instances. Uh, the, my co-author, which are involved in the wireless algorithm, which I will present soon, had uh, successfully implemented the algorithm on networks with uh, more than a thousand nodes. Of course, it is a, it's a heuristic algorithm. Uh, although it uses many approximation algorithm, it's, uh, it's not really uh, possible to say that it's an approximation algorithm itself because it combines many of them. And um, basically the, the, the emphasis of this work was to uh, use uh, their algorithm on transportation network. So I'll jump to the solution algorithm and I'll start uh, directly by presenting uh, the work of Almiani uh, and Hal, which has been recently published by the beginning of the year and which is the main inspiration for the algorithm that we used later. So I'll go through this algorithm uh, step by step uh, and that will very much summarize the main steps in our algorithms too. Um, Basically, the algorithm proposed by Almihani uh, consists of two main steps. The first main step is the tour building. We try to find a tour which spans a maximum number of clusters, uh, and those clusters are actually going to represent, in the end, who, what sensor is assigned to what uh, caching point. And we, it uses a TSP or a heuristic to build that tour, and uh, basically, um, once we obtain the tour, uh, we look at if the tour duration constraint is violated. So it, in this sense, it's very much like a binary search over the, the number of clusters, which again will represent the number of caching points in the network. And uh, the rationale is that if the tour uh, obtained violates the tour duration constraint, well, we'll increase the number of uh, clusters. Uh, Actually, it should be decreased, and otherwise we'll decrease it. Um, so every time we have um, a tour which is too uh, long, uh, we want to reduce the number of constraints of, of points to visit. Every time the tour is too short, we we can increase. Uh, maybe it's not possible, but we look if we can increase the maximum number of points of clusters. The second phase is the tour improvement, where we try to use the remaining slack in the tour duration to uh, adjust the tour. So that will become more clear once I have gone through the, the in detail of the clustering and the planning step. So the clustering step is very similar to a k-means algorithm. We, we start with a given number of caching points to distribute in the network, which we call temporary cluster centers. And we choose them randomly, and then we use the two approximation algorithm to find um, the cluster center. So in this sense, it's very similar to uh, K-means algorithm. We first, first uh, choose C nodes. We add them to a set C. Uh, and until uh, convergence, we look at every node which is not a temporary cluster center 
and we assign the nearest node in the um, uh, we assign this node to the nearest cluster center, and we we put this in a bin which can represent uh, the the cluster uh, corresponding to the cluster center uh, G. Okay. Now once we've done that, we take um, each cluster CJ, and we look at what is the new cluster center. And to do that, we simply take the node which minimizes the total distance within cluster. So the sum of all the distance uh, among the node of the cluster. We take that new, that new cluster center and we add it to C prime. Okay, so we had C which was randomly chosen at the first iteration. And uh, we assigned node to C using closest distance. Now we have looked at the new cluster centers given the, this assignment, and we look at uh, if C equals to C prime. If it is, it means that the cluster centers have not moved, so therefore we have convergence. Um, if it isn't, then we take the new set of cluster centers and update C with that uh, set. Uh, of course, the, the convergence will depend a lot on the uh, initial conditions, on the random uh, draw, and therefore the, the sampling can be useful to, to have a good solutions. It depends a lot on the application actually, but um, we, we've looked at a bit of all, all some methods in that sense, but we have mainly focused that uh, this was more done in uh, the paper by uh, my co-authors on this topic particularly. And we return, of course, a set of clusters. Uh, so each clusters and a cluster center. So the complexity of this algorithm is dependent, uh, well, it's a two approximation algorithm. Uh, since it's discrete distance, um, I, I think uh, everything is maintained, um, but I would, not, I would not really uh, be 100% sure on this. Um, so once we have this set of new clusters, uh, we actually uh, now will try to find a tool which will visit every cluster. Okay, so that tool, of course, can go through any node in the cluster. So it, in that sense, it's a bit uh, similar. This step is very similar to the generalized uh, travel salesman uh, problem, because you're you're given a set of clusters and you are asking for the tool which minimizes the total transportation cost and uh, visits each node in one cluster. Uh, sorry, each cl a node in each cluster. So for this step, we use a uh, TSP heuristic. I think the um, Christophe's uh, heuristic was implemented. And so that's actually the highest uh, complexity of the whole algorithm. But basically, um, the planning step goes this way. We first add the thing to the tool, uh, and we randomly select a cluster among the set of cluster we obtained from the previous set. And for each cluster, we uh, select the nearest node, um, minimizing the total distance uh, from uh, the cluster to the tool. So from we take all the nodes in the cluster, and uh, sorry, all the nodes in the tool and we look at which distance minimize the total sum. Every time we find uh, um, a node in the cluster, the, new, the optimal node in each cluster, we add it to the tour and so on. So again, here also it depends a lot on the order in which you pick the starting cluster and the, the clusters uh, thereafter. I, I know that they have tested some different heuristics to do that, but roughly, uh, random was as good as you could obtain uh, on average. Um, once we have the node, uh, of course, in the each uh, cluster, we can use uh, the Christophe algorithm to find the uh, uh, two, uh, three approximation uh, tour. Um, and uh, that will give us a, a set of nodes, a tour, that will return and will then check if this tour violates the uh, tour duration constraints. Now, the tour building fa uh, step, of course, has a complexity. Uh, 
which also depends on the number of iteration you need in the binary search. So the total complexity of this step is a bit critical, but in practice, it has been observed that it is mostly driven by the TSP heuristic anyway. Now, the final tour improvement will uh, simply try, once we have uh, the, the cluster, the, sorry, the, um, once we have the a tour, once we have sorry, uh, a tour duration, uh, a number of caching points, we'll try to, uh, within each cluster we obtain, um, match, um, sorry, not match, but get the cluster center, the caching points as close as possible as the cluster center, which we had obtained at the previous clustering step. So the clustering step had given us a cluster and a cluster center, the node which minimizes this total distance, but that, may, that node may not have been the node which was closest to the tour. So it may not have been the node which was chosen during the planning step as the node to visit. We have not imposed in the planning step to visit the cluster centers. We have imposed to visit any, a node within each cluster. So the final tour improvements will try to use the remaining slack in the uh, tour duration constraint by looking at uh, uh, every cluster at a time, trying to get a node as possible, as close as possible to the cluster center, which would, on average, uh, minimize the total distance, hence minimize the objective function in the model. Of course, um, this search could be also very complicated, but uh, I know a very simple heuristic was used to maintain the complexity low. And in practice, it was also observed that although the final tour improvement could improve things, uh, it's still a marginal improvement with regards to the first step. So I, I hope I have been clear enough to give you the idea of the algorithm. Um, now, we, we started with that algorithm and we started to solve it on large transportation instances. So it all went uh, very well at first, but then we realized that the most transportation networks were not as connected as the wireless sensor network uh, for which the algorithm was designed. So we, we uh, in particular, in wireless sensor networks, the, the networks are well connected. The routing graph is assumed to be complete and the assignment graph which is defined by taking off edges, which are in the routing graph and are too long with regards to the transit range, um, is generally connected. Well, they actually, they always assume it was connected. So, which is fair for their application, but for us, it's not at all the case. Transportation network have a small, small world structure, isolated centroids, happens a lot when you look at a detailed transportation network where you have a suburb which needs to be serviced, but it's on average very far. And uh, basically that means that the routing graph has a very, very uh, more like a lattice uh, structure. And the assignment graph will be uh, something which may not be connected for any value of the transit range. So we decided to um, look at the, adapt the algorithm by looking at the number of connected components within the transportation uh, network. Of course, that will depend on the transit range. So, sorry, the assignment graph. So for every value of the transit range, we have a number of uh, connected components in the assignment graph. Basically any edge which is longer than TR is removed and you count how many pieces of connected networks you have. So ideally, we would like to visit every connected component because the algorithm was conceived like that. We first looked at this approach. Uh, if we want to be fair and leave everybody, we have to have at least a cardinal of CCTR stations. That is sometimes a lot, especially on large transportation networks. So we decided to um, look at uh, route design parameters which could be used to tune the algorithm so as to balance the solution we obtain, such that very big and dense uh, connected components could receive more than a station and very isolated centroid could be either discarded or just remotely connected. So to do so, we, we looked at many of them, but in the end we decided to focus on two. And two route design parameters. The first one is G, it's a f uh, it's will be a, a fraction of the smallest connected 
component, which will be discarded. So we'll try to count the connected component first and discard some of them. And then with regards to what we obtain, the remaining connecting components will try to increase the number of uh, station uh, pair uh, connected components, so increase the density of station. And we used M, uh, another fraction, to add transit stations. The obtained procedure and the algorithm we have implemented can be summarized like that. We start by first counting the number and identifying the set of connected components by for a given TR, and we sort them by increasing size. We discard uh, a fraction G of the smallest connected component and add them to what we call CC1. The number of elements of CC1 is 1 minus J uh, times the number of connected components in the former graph. And then we add uh, a percent of clusters to that uh, CC2, uh, which would be the set of connected components at the second level. So depending on G and M, uh, the, the number of, uh, the cardinal of CC2 can be um, smaller than CC uh, initially, but it also could be the same. If you add, if you remove and if you add a lot, you'll end up with the same. And basically we decided to um, use this number as an input for the algorithm. So we are we are slightly modifying the structure of the wireless sensor algorithm here. Instead of uh, using a binary search here, we, we use that as the number of transit station. Uh, and um, basically, we then repeat the steps that were used in the wireless sensor algorithm. And that are the clustering step, finding the optimal cluster, and finding the tour uh, visiting each cluster. And uh, of course, uh, the obtained tour may not at all respect uh, the tour duration constraints we would have initially set up. So there are two ways to go about that. We can do a binary search on that after. Um, in practice and for this paper, we have only uh, looked at the relaxed version where we have literally not uh, imposed the tour duration. And we, in contrast, what we did is that we looked at different combinations of G and M and looked at how the uh, solution method would react. And uh, in the end, of course, there is a final tour improvement. Another so question. the, the structure, yeah? So why, I mean, in the previous slides, I mean, uh, couldn't you just add virtual arcs to make it uh, complete uh, or make it connect? Um, ah, OK. I see what you mean. Um, yeah, yeah, we could have uh, we could have done that, but the 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 thing is that in this from a transportation perspective, if you add virtual virtual arcs to connect uh, connected components, which could be represented as which could represent some other transportation mode or something, uh, it it would simply mean that uh, you are uh, well adding some extra resource to the problem. So we discussed this at length, and uh, I know. We, we tried to do that. We tried to violate the transit range locally only to try and maintain um, a connected structure. But it was also our opinion that actually both studies were interesting, the fact of uh, using the connected component approach and the fact of l looking at uh, a fully connected network. So we decided to first look at this, but it's really a one of the things we have thought of doing for, for now, a long time now. Okay. Um, yes, so the transit route algorithm goes like that. Um, let's look at the implementation because um, there's some stuff to say here. Uh, and after I can uh, come back to the possible extension and assumption of the model because I think that uh, it's really uh, one thing that we have noticed is that many, in many ways, this work could be uh, could be done differently. This is really just an example and the first one, but we are looking uh, uh, heavily into uh, producing different variants, and uh, I'd love to hear your opinions. So, to evaluate our algorithm, we looked at a network which is uh, widely used. Uh, available online, the Austin network from uh, Texas. And this network has 7,388 nodes and uh, 18,000 arcs. So it's 
a big network. Uh, we looked at many of them, some bigger, some smaller. The, this one was, uh, was well, let's say that it was clean enough, so you didn't have some uh, weird values in the middle. And we thought that it was big enough to validate uh, the solution algorithm. Um, we, do, we use the Euclidean distance for the assignment uh, cost matrix. And we use free flow travel time, uh, which was given by the instance, because uh, this network is actually used a lot in traffic assignments. So it comes with tra uh, free, free flow travel time, distance, um, some route design parameters, which we didn't use here, but could be of interest if you want to look at the capacity of the arcs. So that's something which uh, could be done on top of this uh, model using a bi-level approach. Um, the routing cost matrix was a travel time uh, with the dual time. We looked at two transit range, which are a bit big, I reckon. Uh, one kilometer for walking is okay, but two kilometers sounds a bit big. But the fact is that we, we have to bear in mind that we are looking at designing a single route in a huge city. So if we looked at shorter transit range, we would have so many connected components that it would not really make sense. Um, in some way, however, the, the, the route we propose in the end is a huge route. And you'll see uh, by the values that it does not not really make sense anyway to have this route in the network. But in the context of evacuation of our very more, uh, let's say, uh, urgent application, well, it could be of interest. So the multi-route is a natural extension. Uh, but um, for this work, we focused on a single one, and we looked at two parameters, uh, two, sorry, two set of values. The discard parameter, we allow it to discard from 0 to 50, and the addition, we go from 0 to 100, so we double the number of stations. Just as a, uh, some information, the initial number of connected components with a TR equal 1 is... Uh, 1600 and uh, with TR equal 2, it's divided by 4 almost. So that was kind of interesting for us because we really wanted to see the sensitivity of the algorithm with regards to the transit range. And um, the first set of results um, are presented um, with this table. So I, I won't ask you to read the whole table, but basically the first two columns give the parameters. Uh, the demand centroid discarded uh, is uh, is in this col uh, the column in the entitled demand centroid discarded uh, gives the number of centroids we removed. And the number of transit stations was determined according to the formula I presented uh, moments before uh, with GMM. So everything after the number of transit stations is a result of the optimization. Um, the tour duration is uh, obtained by just summing up all the travel time with the dwell time on the obtained tour. The total shortest path tour is the distance to the tour, so it's really the core of the objective function. And then we have min and max uh, values, which I'll come back later. Um, basically, the, well, I can just say a quick word, that the mean shortest path to the tour is the uh, average distance from any centroid which is not in the tour to the tour. The max is the max. And the mean cluster size is, um, is the, the average number of centroids assigned to a transit station, and the max is the maximum. So if we first look at the tour duration, uh, we can see that it increases with the number of stations, which remember in this version of the algorithm will given, be given as an input to the algorithm. We'll ask for uh, this many stations to be uh, introduced, and we look at the tour duration. So it increases. Uh, uh, actually a lot with the tour de, with the station, at least quadratically. And the objective function, as you can see, which is represented by this value, is very uh, less sensitive to G. Uh, it does vary, but if you look at the four sets of value, uh, it's far less sensible to G than to M. So that's also interesting. It means that... Um, Discarding centroids may be of interest, but it's really more the density that is at stake here. If you introduce more centroids, especially in the case where M is a 100, we have uh, a lot of uh, improvement in the objective. Or actually, not improvement, but 
انت كروزيز ولا ذا The total shortest path to the tour with respect to the baseline scenario where we both uh, design parameters are zero uh, is roughly reduced by half when M is 25. So when we add uh, one over four station um, per centroid, we, we reduce by half the total distance and by two thirds when we double. So there is not a major improvement, but uh, we can see that just introducing a little more station will help a lot in reducing the total distance to the tour. That is very much a consequence of the fact that if you have a large connected component, if you initially have only a single station, it doesn't look really good at first. So as soon as you add some of them, it helps a lot. Um, if we look at the, sorry, the first results was for the first transit range, one kilometer, this one are for the, we doubled the transit range. And if we compare to what we obtained previously, The, the, like we, uh, we knew in initially, the number of demand centroids discarded is reduced by four. So we, we are now, uh, we have far less uh, station to uh, introduce because uh, the, the, the assignment range is bigger, the transit range is bigger. And so that will help to smoothen things a little. Basically, this time, the total distance uh, to the shortest route is reduced by two-thirds when M is about how, uh, one four, a quarter, and up to four-fifths when M is double, is 100. So the number of stations is doubled. Okay. Um, if we look at the mean and max values, uh, I, I, I didn't talk to a lot about them before because uh, we have some plots which are maybe easier to look at. Uh, if, we, if we look at um, the mean, so on the left-hand side of the slides, it's the uh, mean shortest pass and the maximum shortest pass for TR equal one. On the right, it's for TR equal two. Uh, what we observe is that the distance to transit can roughly be efficiently tuned by both parameters. So if we have, if we are not adding anything, and so if we are on the purple column on the leftmost uh, column, We have like that the mean shortest pass for TR equal one will be about 10 kilometers. So still a lot, realistically, you don't walk that distance, but it can be reduced by approximately half if you um, double the number of uh, station and do not add anything. Uh, as we can see also here, G is less, uh, le doesn't affect as much the output as M. And basically the maximum shortest path and the mean shortest path have a similar trend. Uh, for TR equal one, they, they slightly decrease. For TR equal two, it's a bit different. We have some uh, different behavior when we uh, discard a lot of centroids. So the, the, the green column uh, will generally um, increase the number, uh, the shortest path, uh, meaning that the, the affectation, the assignment is really done differently here. So that's not that a good result for us, but it also means that, uh, yeah, there is room for improvement. Um, if we look now at the cluster size, uh, what we observe is that basically uh, the cluster size will uh, depend mostly on um, your the transit range, at least for the mean cluster size. It does not vary a lot with the parameters, at least not with regards to the, uh, to, for instance, uh, like the, the mean shortest path. Uh, the mean cluster size will remain uh, between zero and 10 for the case of the TR equal one, with of course, um, uh, when you remove a lot of centroids, you increase the uh, number of centroids assigned to uh, your um, station. And finally, the maximum cluster size uh, will decrease, although adding 10% of station will generally not change anything at all, meaning that the connectivity of the biggest cluster cannot be broken by simply adding a little amount of station. You really need to add more stations so as to break the connectivity. Of course, this could be probably more controlled within the algorithm, but the objective of this work was also to look at how the solution method Uh, initially obtained from wireless sensor network would perform here, although we had to make some adjustments. 
So in conclusion, we I'll just summarize the big uh, the big lines of this talk. But basically, we adapted the solution algorithm from uh, wireless and some networks to a transportation setting. We formulated a length constraint route design problem and developed a heuristic algorithm for large networks, which uh, uh, we have observed that is able to correctly re reproduce the behavior that we expect uh, from the model. The implementation, I haven't spoken about the, the running time, but it was, I know, less than, uh, I think, less than an hour. Um, I could, uh, I should confirm that though, but um, it was pretty efficient, even on a, such a large, large network. Uh, the result that we sh obtained mainly showed that um, although we have introduced two route design parameters, they are able to uh, produce balanced solution if we tune them. And this means roughly that we're able to break the connectivity of large connected components. Uh, there is also, um, like I said, many possible extension of this work. So some of them are algorithmic extension to this problem, which uh, you have mentioned, uh, and um, some of them are also more uh, um, on the problem itself. Um, because basically, if we look at the literature in um, transit route design, uh, what has, what is generally done in multi-objective uh, formulation and what we really haven't looked at yet is to introduce penalty uh, cost for not servicing a given centroid. So we have introduced a parameter which helps us removing, discarding centroid, but we are not paying any price for that. Uh, of course, this could be done in several ways. We could look at fairness, uh, which centroid is it better to price, to, to discard or not. Of course, um, if you look at the income rate, average income rate, you could have a fairly good idea of uh, the impact of not servicing uh, such neighborhood or this neighborhood. And that makes total sense when it comes to designing a bus route, which is generally used by people who have less income than uh, people who have a lot of income. So that first objective is actually actually currently under research and we're actually testing models on by, by looking at equity and fairness with regards to the um, servicing of the demand centroids. The second uh, extension is to uh, is very much similar to what uh, is known as facility location problem where we try to open uh, to integrate the cost of opening a station. Um, although, although this may have a limited impact we know from uh, related studies that if you have a very uh, non-uniform uh, cost of land, uh, this could be uh, something that you would like to integrate in your model. Um, ideally, we'd like to integrate the cost of opening a station with the infrastructure, the, the transportation infrastructure. If you have a bus stop, it's maybe easier to build a new bus stop nearby. But if you have strictly no bus stop and uh, um, very little room on your road, then probably it's more costly to integrate the uh, facility there. So this could be integrated in the, in, at the level of choosing uh, the location of uh, centroid, especially within clusters. Um, and finally, the most, um, maybe one of the most difficult extension uh, for this work here um, is to integrate load factors. So that requires a bit more modeling and would require to represent uh, in particular the demand the travel demand for every pair of centroid, which is what we usually do in transportation uh, OD uh, origin destination uh, matrix estimation. Um, so you would need to do the estimation for a network. And after that, we would have to look at the capacity of each station. Of course, to do that properly, we would have to integrate that also with the existing uh, network. And yeah, that, that, that's where it could become very complicated. Um, bi-level approach are possible for that. But a simple approach would be simply to um, restrict the incoming flow. So the number of vehicle that, sorry, the number of people that would travel in the transit vehicle through every station to not exceed its capacity. Um, I think that the, the, the most complicated part of this extension is that it will require a lot of data to properly evaluate uh, 
and calibrate the model. Of course, it's not mentioned here, but the, the most uh, maybe um, interesting uh, extension uh, with regards to uh, transit route the design is to integrate multiple tools. So instead of looking at a single vehicle, what if we are say you are, you are asked to design the whole bus network? Uh, in this case, uh, you want to make sure that you have different, uh, you have more than a single route. So that's about it. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I forgot to mention it, but thank you, Nick, for the invitation. And uh, uh, that's a couple of references. Thank you. So if you have any questions, of course, I'm more than happy to discuss that. Yep. By what factor was the heuristic algorithm uh, worse than the optimal solution? Uh, I don't have a factor because I com it's combining a binary search, a clustering step which has a two approximation, and the tour planning which has three two approximation on the TSP. But by experiments, did you see how much worse it was? Um, they have some. Uh, ah, okay, okay. They have some info on that. Uh, you mean the transport algorithm or the heuristic. the heuristic for the but uh, for what problem? The wireless or the transport? Wireless. So they have this in the journal paper. I don't remember exactly. Uh, they have that. Uh, it's in the first preference here. Um, I, uh, I I really don't remember, so I want to say something wrong. But I can I can uh, ask my co-authors to provide you an answer. Um, I said one. My question. the you had the the linger time added for the. So the, the time that the bus was at... Ah, the dwell time, yeah. yeah. Dwell time, sorry. Not uh, um, so was that something that was in the original wireless? No, not at all. No, that I was... was that doesn't no, 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 no. wireless yeah, thing, yeah. right? No, that was something we added. Uh, uh, since it's Did it mainly... really affect anything? Well, if you assume that you have the triangle inequality, not really. No. Okay. If you don't have it, it may, it may... I think it will turn the uh, TSP heuristic less efficient, but... Uh, uh, that's all, basically. Yeah. Like, uh, it, it, seemed, it seemed, I was just curious how much it impacts your algorithm in a way, because for like buses, right, you want to, it's more about the number of stops. It's more it the number. So we wanted to integrate that initially, and then after discussing with people from the transit side, they said, look, a bus will stop roughly one minute. The problem is that we have tour duration which are far longer. So if we look at a small network, like the, the example in the NDP, uh, so in this network, it does make a difference, actually, because you have little number of stops and you have numbers uh, that total tour lengths are not that long. So in the end, it makes a difference on the solution. Um, I couldn't say it makes a real difference. It's more like a modeling uh, feature. Okay. Anybody got questions from other places? Maybe one short question on demand. Uh, you mentioned, I think, very early on demand elasticity. And I guess as soon as the TR increases, that may reduce demand. I don't know. Yeah, no, so definitely. Um, I think that's. So uh, wouldn't, also, wouldn't also the frequency of, I don't know, the, the bus schedule or the, the, the whatever it is, uh, maybe the ticket price, wouldn't that also influence the demand? No, it's not much of a question, but it's more of a, yeah. I yeah, I no, I think you're right about that. The frequency basically would uh, probably uh, like uh, affect how many people would like to travel, so as the elasticity, of course. Uh, I have recently worked on another paper which uh, looked at this problem, so uh, jointly designing uh, the location of bus stops. So we didn't look at the route, but we just looked at how could we optimally locate stations um, using an elastic uh, model for the demand side. Um, and yes, uh, I think that can be easily integrated in that work. And we, we found that, uh, yeah, given the assumption on the elasticity, but generally you can just assume li uh, something linear, such as uh, the further you go, further is your station, the less people travel. Uh, that, that, that came out nicely, and uh, we had a yeah, quite interesting results, although they are very applied. Uh, thank you. And I, I'll just say, um, I'll talk to you uh, separately. We 
have a very uh, a problem that's coming out a bit like yours, but with an extra term. We're interested in the travel time for each of the passengers. So given an OD pair, uh, we need to calculate the time it takes to travel through this network we've just designed, and then minimize that for all the passengers. OK, but then, ah, it's so a given an OD pair. So you're looking only at a, a single origin destination and many paths, no, maybe? All, all OD pairs. OK. Oh, for all OD pairs? OK, OK. I understand. So you, you compute the time per repair and you... Yeah, yeah that's interesting, yeah. Uh, yeah. The passenger's view of the cost rather than just the uh, city's view of the cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I see what you mean. Uh, no, it's, in, uh, it's actually a good uh, indicator, which is... Uh, I, I've seen it in the literature. We have not really looked at that, actually, but... Uh, yeah. Do you, do you use uh, uh, capacity to... No. Not at all. Uh, yeah. But yeah, but I'll, you. I'll, I'll, I'll get in contact. It's a, a separate talk altogether. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, that's, uh, I'd like to hear more about this. Yeah. Good. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.